truth. I'm, 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 I'm. Welcome to Forbidden I'm, Truth. I'm, I'm, I'm Andrew. I'm Today I'll be speaking with Indiana double murderer Frederick Michael Bear. If you go back to May 2022, you can find my full interview with Bear. Frederick Bear is convicted of the brutal murders of 26-year-old Corey Clark and her 4-year-old daughter, Jenna, which occurred on February 25, 2004, after Bear had left work to commit the murders. Bear attempted to rape Corey before killing her and then slit in the throat of her 4-year-old daughter. On this episode, I speak with Bear about his Princess Diana obsession and a scuffle that he got into recently with a serial killer in there, and how he deals with being one of the most hated men in Indiana, having had so many attempts on his life. Here's my interview with Frederick Michael Bear. Where did they call from? Michael Bear. An inmate at the Indiana Department of Corrections, Miami Correctional Facility. There's a documentary um, about, I don't know if it was death row inmates or just prisoners in general. McDonald, I want to say his, his name was, and you were one of the inmates in the documentary. And a lot of people have asked about this Princess Diana shrine. And um, yeah. uh, they, a lot of people have wanted me to ask you about that and what that was about. And, you know, if you still have it now, but let's start off with, you know, what, what brought you to want to have a shrine of Princess Diana of all people in your prison cell? Being that it's me, it was a condition of my past and everything. Um, I seen Princess Diana when she first got married to Princess Char or Prince Charles, and that's when I fell in love with her. And I've always been an avid, uh, faithfully dedicated follower of Princess Diana and the royal family. And uh, it's just that anything that ever happened with the royal family, I I've always been in tune with and. Uh, paid attention to, but with Princess Diana, I, it was just something with her. I, I've always loved Princess Diana, and uh, I just figured, well, you know, why not? She, she's always been a, a, a lifelong famous icon of mine, and it's just something that I wanted to have on my wall. And so I put my her pictures, I had several books that I got and I tore out my favorite pictures and put them on her wall. I made the frames out of toilet paper and cardboard and glue and I put them, uh, put them up on my wall. And uh, it was just something that I admired along with my cat, Lucky. And uh, it's just something that gave me a peace of mind and a happiness and a joy that I, I always looked at and looked to. So I, I just wanted to uh, iconize her, her, I don't know, idolize her, I guess, yeah, idolize her. And it got to be a little bit much, and then with my faith, I started feeling convicted. I should have any kind of uh, idolization before my Lord and my God, okay? And so if later on, later uh, in years followed, I finally just, you know, put things in this proper perspective and put proper place to the best of my ability and put him first. You know, and I stopped idolizing her and my cat and other things. So, but I still hold her dear in my heart. I still love Princess Diana, and I always had a thing that uh, if or when I do die, if it would be possible, I'd like to be cremated, half my ashes to be put in the ocean, and the other half of my ashes put into the moat of water that surrounds. Uh, Lady Diana, where she's in her final resting place. Uh, there, I think it's in uh, Kensington Palace, I believe it is. But, yeah, you know, kind of weird, stupid. But, you know, it's just something that I've always been in love with Princess Diana. I always have. For what she represents, she's royalty, she's elegant, she's rich, she's sophisticated, she's smart, she's caring, she's loving, she's kind. Uh, she's all that that a, a guy could ever want or hope or desire to have in a babe, you know. But yet she's down to earth and she's approachable and she's human. And she just represents so many facets of, of humanity, of being just a good person with loving, kind, consideration and care and concern for just a common person. And she didn't look at people with a, a stereotype, stigmatized, worldly label like so predominant for so many other people in the world. They, people are so busy looking down their noses, so I'm royalty, I'm rich, or I'm really important, or 
well, I can't hobnob or associate or talk or be in your company because you're a commoner or you're a peasant or you have AIDS or something. She broke down the stereotypes of being judgmental and so aristocratically egotistical, self-righteous in so many respects. And that's why the, the royal family doesn't really like her so well. But, you know, she was just a common everyday person because she was just elegant and sophisticated and so kind and considerate and caring for so many reasons, for so many people, irregardless of their status or position or, or, or lack thereof. I don't know, man. It's just, that's the kind of a woman that appeals to a lot of men, you know. I, I gotta ask you, I know that there's been a lot of crazy things said over the years. What do you think happened to her? I mean, I know officially she was in a car accident, but do you have any theories? Yeah, yeah. well, my theory is it was, I, my theory is it was that uh, she wasn't taken serious in her pleas and cries for help from her immediate family and all her immediate friends and, and immediate family there in the royal family, they really didn't want to, you know, keep her cries and, and give her the proper help that she needed. And yet, you know, they, they wanted to remain their uh, the level of, uh, of sophistication and, and arrogance and, and, and loyalty. And they felt that if they, you know, if they do anything like that, they would bend it and break their integrity just wrong. So my theory is that uh, the, the media is the main ones that hounded her to death. And uh, like uh, Prince Williams and Prince uh, Andrew, or, or uh, Harry, excuse me, Prince William and Prince uh, Harry, uh, they are totally correct. They, the media hounded their mom to death. They harassed her. They didn't give her no peace, no mind. But as far as a, a royal family can uh, murder conspiracy? I, I I don't think not. I think not. I, I don't think that the Queen and her uh, affiliations are, are that cow- cold and callous. I think the media is was the ones that hounded her to death just to get a, pic- a picture of her to buy the meal ticket, feeding off her, and just to get a promotion and, and have a better life to get that money shot of her so they can you know get the top dollars and top money and that, that was the main drive of a lot of people which the bible speaks of the, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil those reaching out for that love will stab themselves over with many things and i think that's what a lot of uh, uh paparazzi was is their sole goal driven purpose is the love of money and to be recognized and they stabbed the world level with many things because it counted Princess Diana to death. That's my theory. So. You've told me a couple times now about an altercation you had with a serial killer uh, there in Indiana by the name of William Clyde Gibson. Did you know anything about him prior to having that scuffle with him? Did you know about his crimes or anything he's said to have done? Uh, just by the conversations that he and I shared and talked with and how he had done certain crimes in his past and that there's other crimes that's still yet undiscovered and held unaccountable attached to him. But I had no prior knowledge of him prior to death row before our altercation. No, it, you know, he was swayed by other people's opinions about me and stuff, but, you know, that's where we led to our controversy towards one another. But, what uh, what, no, what led up to me. it? Like, what was, do you know what was being said about one another that led up to the altercation? Everybody didn't like me. A lot of people didn't like me because of the fact of what I've said and done in my past, you know, and that led me to be in prison, which is understandable to a point. But apparently there's, you know, a hierarchy of ego and pride and arrogance with some people. And uh, they wanted to look down on me, step and squash on me to elevate themselves up to be well thought of and liked. And that such being 
So did you guys actually get in like a fist fight, or was it just like words were said? Did any of you end up in, like, the infirmary or anything? Huh? Did any, either of you end up in the infirmary? No. We just had a couple bumps with bruises and black eye and, and, you know, hurt pride. You know. Was there anything Uh, said afterwards, like, I'm going to kill you or not, I'm going to kill you? And I know that I know that a lot of I know that a lot of uh, they say a lot of you know predators or child predators or even people that commit crimes against children, whether it be a homicide or a sex abuse or this or that, have a hard time in there. And has it been pretty hard for you, even if you've been in PC or general population for that matter? Like, have you had many attempts on your life or been having yeah. to be more cautious? Oh, cool. 
So what? So what did they try to like stab you and you took it away from them and hit them or guards rushed or how did how did you stop it? Well, I avoided being stabbed. I was trying to keep my door shut after they got the the, the staff member to open the door. How did they? How did they get them to open it? They just went up there and told the staff, said, "Hey, I need you to open this cell." And they was out on sanitation, so uh, they had a lot of influence with staff. And so he went up there. They went up there and told the staff member open this door, and they opened the door, not knowing, not aware what was going on between the other inmates and I. And so when the door opened up, I tried to shut it. And I had uh, inmate on one side and inmate on the other side of the door with knives. And somehow or another, I, by the grace of God himself, I squeezed through both, went out into the day room, ran around the table uh, while they had knives with a couple others coming up on me. And I went around the table and back in my room and slammed the door shut to where I was able to barricade the door long enough to, you know, you know get them to calm down or whatever, get the guard to isolate my door. And so I avoided that. Well, later on, the guy ended up getting into an altercation with somebody else, and he got in trouble and taken out. So, But later, we got we made amends, because I knew some other inmate who knew that inmate up to Michigan City Prison, and they was buddies with this guy that tried to attack me. And he squashed it off for me, pretty much. And, you know, it was that was it. Is that the only is that the only time anybody's ever tried to like kill you to the point where they actually got within a couple of feet away from you? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. That was the only altercation. Uh, the one in Kaidorm where they robbed me, and they both of them had knives, but they didn't do anything. And then the altercation when I was, or no, excuse me, in Eldorm, that's when they got robbed at knife point by those two guys. Then the altercation in Kaidorm, that was it. I've been in a couple squabbles here and there, but, you know, it's nothing major or whatever. You know, uh, everything was resolved, so. Do you ever sit there during, the, like, the day or the nighttime and just just sit there and think, you know, when's the next one coming? You know, am I ready for it? Do you ever think about that, or you just roll with the punches as they come? I pretty much roll with the punches when they come, because if I sit there and dwell on it, I, I start to have a, anxiety or panic attacks or I let it uh, spin in my head to where I get all caught up in my head and my emotions and my feelings and be super hypervigilant and, and scared, you know. The dorm that I'm in now, I'm in, it's the honor dorm because of the fact that I, I've stayed out of trouble, I've stayed conduct free, I've got a job uh, over in the industry, uh, garment industry so where I'm sewing and, and working and stuff. So I try and stay out of trouble so I don't lose my job and get kicked out of my door. Um, I, I'm hoping to get minimum wage because, you know, that's how I make uh, my state pay. And so that way I can sustain myself and take care of myself and all that. But uh, I don't, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I mean, if, if it's somebody from my past, okay, if it's somebody in my past, you know, they've got a bloodthirst, hate, revenge, get back, then I guess that's one of them. They have to live with it longer than I do. Don't get me wrong, Andrew. I'm not a badass. I'm not a, in a John Wayne type mentality where I think I can whoop the world, but I'm not a coward and a punk to where I'm just going to let somebody just come up and beat the crap out of me or put their hands on me or whatever. I'm going to try to avoid the trouble and avoid the problems. That's, you know, again, I'm trying to live my life by the standards of what the Bible got, it, it says, and the guidelines of what it says, where as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably amongst all men. Now, I don't claim to be, be a very good human being or a very good person of my past or, or a very good spiritual person, period. But I do try and live my life by certain uh, standards of morals to be a good person apart from my past. I can't undo my past, but we all have one. But I'm not God, and I'm not in a place in a position to look down on someone else and judge them for their past and, and think that I'm better than them or they're better than me. And so I 
stress and the problems like so many others do. I mean, that's the only thing I can do. And, and like the Bible says, as much as it depends upon you, live peacefully amongst all men. And that's what I try and do. Am I perfect and righteous in all this? No, I'm not. You know, I still look at pretty good looking women on TV. I'm still a grown man. I still have wants and needs and happies and sads. All this. I just don't walk around and, and try and lord my, my truth and knowledge and spirituality on nobody or, or think that I'm something more than what I am. I'm just a common everyday person like everybody else. You know? Just to screw up with the past like everybody else does. That I, I can't undo my past. No more than William Gibson or John Stevenson or, or Michael Dean Overstreet or Jeff or, or anybody. Nobody can undo their past. And you know, I don't think that it's a badge of honor to do the things that we've done to cause so much pain and, and problems like we have. Some people like that, some people don't. And I'm one of the kind that I don't think my past is anything to be bragging or boasting about. It's shameful and it's ugly to, to do the things that I've done and to cause the pain and the problems that I have to so many lives. But for people in my past that take a vindictive revenge and hate that can even with me make me suffer because of my past, their life isn't going to get better. And, and you know, that's a root of bitterness being planted, springing up and defiling so many lives, thinking that, that just for something that I've said and done in my past, they're going to get even with me by making me pay and suffer and make me broken. Their lives are not going to get better, but it's going to become worse. Do you feel like it gets worse for you day by day as as time goes on, as you you know get older and you know look back? Uh, I know what my, my past is, and I know that I've got a stigmatized uh, label upon my jacket because of my past. Nobody likes a, a person that's done the things that I've done. Some people, you know, I get to know about my past, like in this dorm, a lot of people know about my past. I'm not proud of it, I'm not bragging and boasting about it, but I don't hide it, you know. I, I use it as a platform to show what the Lord's grace has done in my life and what he's done helped me out to be a better person. Do I think about it? Yeah, I do. And it, and it concerns me about my future, but I'm not going to let my past dictate my future I'm just going to live right now one day at a time in the present doing the best that I can to be a better human being apart from my past if you had to tell anybody like say you had like a say 16 or 17 year old kid coming straight to prison I'm, and I'm not even speaking death row general population what would you tell them like the three worst things that is in, in store for them in prison you know to that they need to either prep for or need to be watching out for
Michael Dean Overstreet or Ben Ritchie or whoever you are, or William Gibson. I don't care if you're if you're Queen Elizabeth or, or some royal dignitary or public official or, or high-ranking public dignitary in society. You're human before anything in this world that you attach yourself to find your identity. And people forget this. People forget because of the place and the platform of position once we become human, you know? We rise up to a certain arrogance or level of, of ego and pride. And we forget where we come from and we forget that we're all human with the same wants and needs and desires and happies and sads. And it's sad and sick and pathetic that the world's condition is so cold and callous and becomes so waxed over with cold and callousness and lack of love towards one another. Because the world and, the, and money and things of the world shows a respecter of persons and where God is no respecter of persons. Love is the predominant force of what we should have and hold and, and, and consider and regard one another, here regardless of the past. Love is the only thing that helps people understand and become better people and help one another. I'm, 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 I'm,